Well, good morning. God bless you all, and welcome to our worship service together at Kaiser Christian Church. Welcome to everyone joining us uh, on the live feed. Let's begin our time together this morning with music. call to worship. Sing praises to God, you people of faith. We give thanks to God who heals and restores. Praise God who transforms us, who heals and loves us. Praise God who clothes us with joy. Do not be silent. Praise the Lord. We give thanks, O oh God, today and always. Will you pray with me? Wisdom of God, come and dwell among us. We gather to hear your word and to sing your praise. We come as we are, trusting that your grace will perfect us. Interrupt our lives with your vision of truth and love. We praise you now and always. Amen. Yeah. 
come now to a time of lifting our joys and our burdens up to God in prayer. We do this as individuals, blessed creations of God. We do this also as the body of Christ together, interwoven as one whole worshiping being However, we can imagine that. It is sometimes beyond our understanding how that vision of God works. We have a, a sense of ourselves, who we are. We think we know who the people sitting next to us are. We wonder what we are together. We come with different levels of being vulnerable with each other. We know each other's stories in different ways and depths. Some of us know each other's fears, concerns, and our deepest joys. Some of us are altogether unknown to one another. In all of that, God puts us together in surprising and sometimes unlikely ways, makes us a community, a community unique in its shared and common faith and belief. In that sense, we come together each Sunday as one, not just in this space, but wherever people gather professing belief in Jesus Christ, there the body of Christ is. There we are, as they are here. Let us pray 
together as one body this morning. Holy God, you know our innermost being. You know each of us as individuals. You know us all as the body of Christ, as your community of believers, your disciples. You know each of our woes and our worries, our gladnesses, our thanksgivings, and our joys. We come before you at this time of worship, lifting our prayers up to you, O God, knowing that you are God with us, a God who listens and responds. You hear our prayers for peace in the world, and we know that you respond, that your Holy Spirit is in those places, your people are in those places. You hear our prayers for healing and for comfort, and you respond. Your Holy Spirit is there, surrounding, healing, being present in and through the body of believers that you send. You hear our thanksgiving prayers for blessings and joys received. The ways you have responded. And you continue to send that spirit within each of us, inspiring us in new and unexpected ways to reach out in faith, sharing your good news. Thank you, O oh God, for the ways that you use us, the ways that you call us to be your hands and feet in the world. Continue to open our hearts and minds to the ways of your kingdom, God. Continue to lead us in the way that we should go, the way your son Jesus came into our midst to show us. the way that Christ continues to show us. Hear our prayers, O God. Hear us now as we continue in worship this morning, praying together the way your Son taught us to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. i 
wasted years until the past disappeared. Let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could. Go work it all out for your good. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Pray a blessing upon the young ones in our community this morning. Holy God, Lord Jesus, who changes lives, pray your blessing upon these young ones in our midst, in our community, our families our circles of faith and love. May your Spirit always guide them, call out to them. May they hear your voice. We find ourselves in that, that sliver of the lectionary calendar, there's a big swaths of green if you, if you look at the, the diagram of the, the lectionary calendar that's a, a circle and it has wedges carved out for each season of the year. You know, we've got the purple sections for Lent and for Advent and you've got the big swaths of green that cover summertime and the ordinary times, and then there's a little flash of red for Pentecost, and there's splashes of white in there for Christmas and for Easter. We find ourselves in that, what most people don't remember is, is its own little season between Easter Sunday and Pentecost. Easter tide, we call it. So we leave the white decorations open, or we get to take full advantage of our abundance of Easter banners, not just that one Sunday, but we get to enjoy them for a few weeks, actually, which I always thought was kind of nice. Easter tide, this in-between time of Easter and Pentecost. This year, we're going to be diving into the book of Acts, looking at the surprising acts of God, the way God infiltrates our lives in unlikely and surprising ways. To start off, we're looking at the story of, in most of our Bibles, probably would be titled, The Conversion of Saul. 
this one who later becomes the Apostle Paul, character who is first introduced to us back in chapter 7 of Acts, uh, verse 58 in the, in the story of the stoning of Stephen. He's the one standing there holding the cloaks, nodding his approval. Stephen's martyrdom. See, before his experience with Jesus on the road, Saul is a self-imposed champion of Judaism, devoutly faithful, enemy of Jesus' followers, the pursuer and persecutor of them, one who invoked fear in the followers of Jesus. This is who Saul is leading up to this moment on the road. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that he, if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. The Lord said to him, Go. For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house, laid his hands on Saul, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. His sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Traditionally, our focus in this passage has been on 
the character of Saul. And admittedly, the, the character of Saul as Luke portrays him is not a particularly well-developed character. We know a few definite things about him, that he, he is quite zealous, that he is taking it upon himself to, to pursue the followers of Jesus, to arrest them and put them in jail, that he approves of their martyrdom. But as far as his particular motivation, what his feelings are, his emotions, Luke doesn't tell us. Whatever we remember about that or think about that has come from our own human imaginations, imagining what somebody like a person going after people that would arrest them and put them in jail, certainly facing death, what their possible motivation would be. We, we have to imagine it for ourselves. We also have taken the story of conversion, as we've labeled it, and made it a, a benchmark or a, an archetype, something to, to model our own faith journey after. We often seek out or, or lift up miraculous conversion experiences or, or somehow like Paul's. But if we think about it and we, we think about what Saul got up to after this, his experience with Jesus on the road didn't actually change him that much. It changed what he did with who he was, where he directed his energies and his zealousness for faith in God. Upon getting a little more information, expanding his belief to include Jesus as Messiah. But the, the core of who Saul was, who God created, him to be devoutly faithful, passionate to the point of of pursuing people in the name of faith. That Saul still existed. He didn't get changed into something else. Jesus took that energy and he still, by his own account later in his letters, definitely a Jew who believed in Jesus. But Jesus took that person on the road, blinded him, slowed him down, and, and redirected him, pointed him in the proper way to go. Reading the story and reflecting on Saul's experience in, in being redirected by Jesus, I, I find myself thinking about kids at summer camp. And how often, you, if you've ever worked with large groups of, particularly middle schoolers, who are, are wonderful creatures, but when you get them together and put them in a in a, a new context where there is much to explore and maybe some new rules and, and things to, to be avoided that they don't necessarily know why or they wonder about or, or all manner of opportunity for mischief. They will direct their energies in some inappropriate ways. And a lot about working with them and creating community in that space, particularly faithful community, and modeling what the church can look like 
for them in, in a camping experience is, is about redirecting that energy. Not always saying, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. No, Saul, don't arrest people. It's about taking their God-given energy that they are currently misdirecting. Swinging it in a different direction. Not stamping it down. Crushing them. turning them in the way that they should go. There's a, a lesson I think we, we learned from Jesus throughout Scripture. Meeting people on the road where they're at, turning them in a new way. As we often focus on the character of Saul in the story, we forget sometimes that there's, there's another main character. Even though neither of these are doing the, the primary acting, God is the one who acts in this story as in most of the stories we have in Scripture. But the other one we have named here is this one, Ananias. And we don't know much about him either, other than he, that he is disciple. Disciple in Damascus. Jesus, in, in good biblical fashion, calls to him, and, and Ananias answers like his prophetic forebears, Here I am, Lord. Just as Saul responds to a call from God, so does Ananias. One who knows this character, Saul, is someone to be feared and avoided at all cost. It's the same one that Jesus calls him to go and to be with, to confront, to face his fear, to invite this one who God has made vulnerable and slowed down into brotherhood, to lay hands on him, We so often read this passage and in the, in the scope of, of thinking of it as a, an ideal sort of conversion experience, one that, that is a miraculous changing by God of our, of our lives towards being a follower of Jesus, we oftentimes align ourselves with the character of Saul. Don't we? Whether, whether it's particularly accurate or not, we... We take the kind of archetypal image we've created or, or imagine Saul to be, and we say, like, we want an experience like that. What if we're more like Ananias a lot of the time? The one that God comes to and calls to be the one reaching out in comfort and in guidance. What if? Because both of these characters were used in, in surprising ways to model God's intention for humanity. To be the ones laid low, needing help, who were previously possessed of the most supreme confidence, however inappropriately directed, and also those who would avoid confrontation for fear and lack of confidence. Both of these Characters in this story called beyond their limited scope of experience and knowledge, inspired by God to do, to be a part of miraculous events. Jesus uses Saul's 
own zeal redirects it to reach Gentiles with the good news. Jesus uses Ananias' own faithfulness and trust to reach Saul to interpret for him and to offer guidance and healing. Friendship, even in a manner of sorts, brotherhood. The beginnings of forgiveness. You can read this story with fresh eyes and see that it's not always about having an experience on the road like Saul's or Ananias's, but about being ready and willing to accept God acting in surprising ways to respond to that call that God puts on our lives. The story is about much more than conversion experience. Just a one-time event. Because this inbreaking of God into our lives, surprising us, calling us to do things we know are beyond our ability, that happens again and again. Sometimes the opportunities are there and we don't even notice them. It's about being ready and willing to accept those opportunities of God acting in surprising ways to respond to the call God puts on our lives to be able to to help one another to recognize those surprising events. Sometimes the invitation is there and we don't even know it. We need someone alongside us with a slightly different perspective to see, oh, what if this is what's happening? Because even though we we read the story and we, we often focus on Saul as an individual having this individual experience, we have to remember that he wasn't alone at any time during this event. He was surrounded by other men on the road. Even when Jesus blinded him with the light that they couldn't see, they stuck with him. Imagine how strange and possibly terrifying it could have been to be following this religious zealot on the road, knowing he was on the way to Damascus to track down these errant believers in Jesus. And all of a sudden, he collapses in the middle of the road, calling out, blinded, claiming there's some bright light shining. And all you hear is an ethereal voice. Not directed at you or any of your company, but at this one who has collapsed on the ground. Would you stick around? They did. They stayed with him. They led him by the hand into Damascus. Ananias received a vision from God, responds in faithful response, Here I am, Lord. Gives some pushback, says, I know, Do you know who this guy is? Do you know what you're asking me to do, God? He says, Yeah, I know. You tell him this. Ananias goes and is there, present with him, laying hands upon him in brotherly love offering healing and guidance, blessing, ordination even. This is the model for our ordination practice for leaders in our churches. This is it. Ananias is there. 
after this event. We know Saul goes on eventually to become Paul the Apostle and is interacting with the Jerusalem Council and the leaders of this new movement of following Jesus. He's surrounded by them, surrounded by by co-leaders in the faith, people he is called to mentor. He is always surrounded by support of a believing community. We get the picture of Paul once he becomes Paul, is formerly Saul, as someone who is always off kind of lone rangering on his own. But we forget that he names so many along the way. He is surrounded by a cloud of witnesses all the time. One of the questions that this passage often brings up for us as believers as the church, considering this character of Saul, described as an enemy of the church. What does God do with enemies of the church? We find in this story Luke's answer to that question. with the help of people's faithful response and willingness to serve, God makes them unlikely friends. These two, Ananias and Saul, there was never two with greater reason to be enemies. Ananias was the exact person that Saul set out from Jerusalem to catch to imprison, whom Saul was convinced was an enemy of his faith, an enemy of the one true God. Ananias feared Saul for the same reason. Jesus speaks to them. pushes them together. Each of them responding in faith. Now they are never probably friends in the traditional sense that we think of, but they are forever brothers in faith. Even love. Because you cannot cannot lay hands on somebody who is hurting and afraid, offering them guidance and, and the word of God to them. You cannot do that and not love them. This is the way, the way Jesus calls us all to follow. Whether we find ourselves in the role of Saul or of Ananias at various times in our lives, we must be prepared to both admit our wrongdoing our wrong direction, and to face our fears in answering God's call upon our lives. We can take some solace and encouragement as we remember that these two were never alone in their adventure with God. 
They're always surrounded by communities of faith, always supported, empowered constantly by God's Holy Spirit. We can remember that Jesus acting in our lives in surprising, unexpected, sometimes even unwelcome ways is much less an isolated incident than it is a more common occurrence than we may realize. From the smallest everyday opportunity to the once-in-a-lifetime events. It's we who are often blind to God's movement. The constant call is to open our eyes, to let the scales fall away, to help each other realize that they're even there. To slow down. God forced Saul to do. So that we might hear and see God's calling in the moment and hopefully have the courage to respond. Amen? Let's continue in our time of worship together this morning and singing our hymn of response. Open my eyes that I may see. This moment for stewardship is inspired by Acts 9, 1 through 20. When we hear the story of Saul, persecutor of the first Christians, we hear of a man on a mission. God, however, had a completely different storyline for this man. Saul had power, position, and people who were ready to help him take care of any Christians who crossed his path. 
We first met Saul in Acts 7 at the stoning of Stephen and can only imagine him yearning to end the lives of other believers in just such a horrendous way. Yet chapter 9 tells the story of a disciple named Ananias who came to touch Saul, bringing sight back into his eyes and insight to his heart. Ananias gave what he had in response to a vision from God. Total transformation was Saul's response to Ananias' presence. As we come to our offering, I want to challenge each of us, what vision is God giving us? What can we give in response to that vision? Our financial support for this congregation is one response. And as a congregation, we're able to reach out in one response to help transfer lives beginning with different organizations in Kaiser, like the Com Kaiser Community Food Bank, Samanka Place. Plus, we reach out through Compassion International to share support to regions outside of our area. Friends, we too are instruments to be used by God. Let us receive our morning offering and continue to find new ways to respond to God's call on our lives as individuals and as a congregation. Let us pray. Merciful God, even as you work to transform Saul's life, filling him with your spirit and opening doors for him to share the good news of Jesus, the Christ, so we give you thanks for the ways you work to transform our lives. Thank you for each one here today, both those here in person and those online. Thank you all for these gifts now offered that they may be open doors to transform that they may open doors to transformed lives here and around the world. Amen. As most of you know and are comfortable with and in disciples churches, we we celebrate Lord's Supper, communion, every Sunday throughout our denomination's history. There, we have fielded somewhat regular criticism that, in doing it in such a regular way, that that some of the, the deep meaning behind this practice and this sacrament would sometimes dilute it or we would forget the, the intent and the, the meaning behind this gift that Christ has given us, this path to connection with our Creator our Savior, and each other. And while at times that sometimes criticism has proven valid in practice and familiarity, sometimes we forget the significance. It becomes mundane. But usually not for all of us at the same time. That's where doing it together makes a big difference. Same as coming to worship on a Sunday morning. Sometimes one or more of us may walk into this space a little bit reluctantly, not really feeling it that day. It's the same with the times that we approach this table. Our minds can be clouded with other myriad distractions or concerns. We forget to honor and take the time to slow down, to slow our minds down, to make space to hear and to see what God is doing. God is inviting us to participate in doing. God is always breaking into our lives in unexpected ways. 
Sometimes we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Other times we don't. The times we don't are when we need one another the most. Because just as God was talking to both Saul and Ananias, sometimes if we don't hear or see what's going on, hopefully one or the more of the others of us are. Have the courage of Ananias to speak up. Share a good word with us. Remind us of God's invitation, of the great and awesome gift of being this close, connected with our Creator and our Savior. And so, it's okay if you don't always feel the moving of the Spirit as you approach the sanctuary or the table. It doesn't mean that God isn't moving. It means that you might just need to slow down a little more. Take a little bit longer to listen. Ask somebody else for help. That's what we're here for. Will you pray with us? Living God, living Christ, and living Spirit, Open our hearts that we may recognize your presence in our midst. Let us eat this bread and drink the cup that you offer as a sign of Christ's presence. Open our eyes that we may see your glory, for you are great. Open our mouths that we may, might sing your praises, for you are worthy. Open our hands that you might serve others, that we might serve others in love and mercy, for you are compassionate. As you have fed and cared for us in giving us this meal. Let us feed and care for the others in, our, in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we approach Christ's table this morning, we remember, as we commemorate this meal, Jesus with his disciples serving them and continuing to teach them up to his last moments, taking a simple piece of bread, blessing it for them, breaking it and handing it to them, saying, take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat it, you remember me. In like fashion, he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he poured it out for each of them, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for forgiveness. As often as you drink it, you remember me. Let us join together now as the body of Christ in Holy Communion.
Let's all stand and sing our hymn of benediction together. Peace.